Welcome everyone as you're coming in. We're going to wait for a few minutes for everyone to join us and then we'll get started. We've got 64, oh, 68 people so far. We'll give everyone just a minute more. So welcome everyone to the second day of the second ever Osher Virtual Open House. We are pleased and delighted to have so many of you joining us today. If you missed yesterday's session, which is the other half of our winter offerings, never fear, our amazing marketing team recorded it and you can find the link for recordings for both sessions on the front page of our website within the next few days. My name is Jill Meyer. I am the new interim director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Utah. Lauren Anderson's last day was November 30th and we all miss her very much. With me today are the two other members of our Osher team, Sheila Jacobson, who is our very special special events coordinator. Sheila lawlessly planned this event for us all today. Sheila. Hi everyone, welcome to the open house. We look forward to seeing you in classes this term. Thanks Sheila. And we also have Emily Miller, who is our very organized and very talented program assistant who helps keep everything running smoothly for us all, instructors, members, and staff. It's a big job and she does it beautifully, Emily. Hi everyone, we are glad to have you here and we hope you find some classes that you're interested in. Thanks, Emily. Usually at this time of year, we are gathering for our much loved annual holiday member luncheon at Little America Hotel downtown. So while we know today is definitely not the same at all, we are very thankful to all of our instructors who agreed, who agreed to present to you today online to preview what they will be teaching this January and February. Normally at our in-person instructor previews, we have printouts of syllabi for you to gather and read. Syllabi are now available on our website under each course page. Look for a red link to click that says download syllabus. That link will open the syllabus and give you the instructor's outline and overview of the course. Emily has been hard at work to create this wonderful new feature for you. If the instructor has submitted their syllabus, the link will be there. Today, we will hear from instructors in the topics of music, literature and writing, politics and governments, and health. So for this virtual open house, we will take questions for our instructors at the end of each topic session for as long as we have time. So if you have a question for them, please type your question in the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. I will read your Q&A questions off to the instructors who will answer in a panel at the end of their topic's time. If you comment in the chat feature, everyone in our Zoom will be able to read your comments, but I'll only be able to read aloud those questions placed in the Q&A. So please take just a moment to familiarize yourself with which one is Q&A and which one is chat at the bottom of your screen. This Zoom webinar is a little different from what we're used to in our regular OSHER Zoom classes. And one other note on that, unlike a regular OSHER class, we won't be able to call on you to ask your question personally. We, have, we are expecting about 100 people in our Zoom webinar today. So we're just taking Q&A questions. Everything is online and OSHER registration begins online tomorrow, Friday, December 11th at 9 a.m. 
Since we're all working remotely, you won't be able to call the OSHA offices, but if you need assistance, you can always reach us through email. We want to thank you, our members, for sticking with us during this past challenging year of adapting to our new normal of OSHA going online. We know that Zoom is not the same as in-person classes, so thank you all, instructors and members alike, for joining us online and keeping the wonderful OSHA program going. With that, let's get started. Our first instructor today is Pat Lambros. She is our only instructor who has been given special permission to meet this winter in person to teach us about Google Maps. Pat? Welcome everyone. I'm very grateful that I am the one class that gets to meet in person. And I just wanna share with you, fear not, this Google Maps class we successfully uh, in November had seven students. We socially distanced very carefully in the lab. It's the uh, main floor lab. You can see from the uh, shared screen uh, on your desktops or whichever device you're using to Zoom on this uh, meeting. And there's plenty of hand sanitizers and wipes and we are all masked up, so, so, so fear not. So anyway, for Google Maps, uh, thank you, Sheila, for putting that on, that uh, screen on. We, the first week is basics, covering all the features, all the different types of things that you can do. And um, one of the, on the second uh, bullet, creating list and your custom maps. So I'm just gonna show you on my screen, one of the um, maps that you'll be able to create. And this one is a maps of the national parks. And there's also driving routes and place marks and all variety of tools that we'll figure out together how, how to create. And then you'll be making your own personal maps. And then um, another feature that you're able to work on is one that is called lists. Let me, um, I apologize. You may not have share, seen that shared screen, but I think I'm sharing now. And this is how you create lists. This feature, came on board in Google Maps about a year and a half ago. I really didn't know about it till I had a just-in-time need. I went to the San Juan Islands in September cycling. I'm an avid cyclist. And so I created a San Juan's list of all the sites that my husband and I were going to visit. So this is another uh, area of uh, creation that you're gonna learn how to do. And in the second week of our meeting, we'll dive deeper and you'll create more maps and learn about features, searching on a variety of topics, how to use offline maps. And uh, I look forward to you attending and we will be safe in these COVID times. I know everything's surging, but we can do it. We did two different classes, like I said last month. So I look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. I took Pat's Google Tools class and that was a life changer. So maybe I'll get to take Google Maps sometime. Next, we have our history instructor, Eileen Stone, who was unable to join us, but Sheila has um, a video for Eileen that she's gonna show for us so that we can hear from Eileen what she will be teaching rural voices in the winter term. Hi, my name is Eileen Helen Stone. I'm a published writer, a public historian, and I believe a part-time detective who thrives on traveling on back roads to discover lesser known stories about this incredible state and about the state's ethnic and cultural diversity. The many contributions that people have made to the development of Utah and those downright different and down to the earth stories that are illuminating, smart, covering, funny, tough, and transporting. Some of these stories address prohibition, matters of inequity, and women's suffrage. They take into account paper sons and daughters, union strikers, depressions, mining disasters, and when the protective guns were pointed in at the innocents and not out. Some stories dip into the lore of cowboys, outlaws, soil doves, they look into single women homesteaders, 
round chicken coops, mountains that move and Gandhi dances on rails. They raise the dead and they really have fun with Utah's insatiable love affair with cycles, speed and sweets. There are so many stories in Utah. Some of you may know them, others might know a few. There's always something new. There's Rosie the Riveters, the American soldiers, the Japanese 440 seconds. There's the push for equality, spear, sounds like a movie title, and underground tunnels that danced in the rip-roaring past. I would love to share some of these stories with you. These are Utah stories and tell you the behind the scenes discoveries and the uncanniness of just being there at the right time and at the right place to have a good story that falls in your lap and one that I'm so happy to be able to catch, take up and now give back to you. Please join me. My class is called Rural Voices and Immigrant Tales of Utah, part two. It will be held from January 14th to February 18th on Thursdays from 9.30 to 11 in the morning. Thank you and I hope to see you there. Thank you. Well, our thanks to Eileen for joining us. Her camera said Randy Silverman, that is her husband. He's a librarian at the Marriott Library. Next up, we have Geraldine Johnson, who's going to be teaching music appreciation for us. And we might be having technical difficulties with her camera. Geraldine, are you with us technologically? Like we're having difficulty with Geraldine. Oh, she can't hear us. Hello. Oh, Geraldine, um, you're here. Something happened when I was made a panelist and now I can't hear anyone speaking. <laughs> so I don't know what happened to my camera. It's up and it was working. And then, I don't know, it's one of the treasures of Zoom, I guess. Um, but if you can hear me, Jill, if you don't mind sending me a chat back just so I can read off what I have. Okay, great, then I'll speak. This is kind of in the void, so that's interesting. Um, I am Geraldine Johnson, and I will be teaching music appreciation. We're kind of turning this into a 101 class, uh, so it will be a repeat of the class I taught last term with a follow-up class hopefully to come in the future. So this, the form of this class works pretty well online because we learn a little bit about the history via PowerPoint slides, and then we listen together to the pieces that we just discussed. So it's all via computer. And as long as you have speakers, we're able to listen to the music together. So a little bit about me. I recently moved to Sandy from Boston, where I got a master's degree from the Boston Conservatory in music performance with an emphasis in oboe. So I love orchestral works. I've um, always been fascinated by music history and have found that the more I know about the circumstances that produced a particular piece of music, the better I am able to enjoy it and connect with it. So I'm hoping to share that experience with you. In music appreciation, we will begin with a brief overview of the foundations of Western music and how the musical notation system was developed. Then we will de delve into specific works by the big names of Western classical music. We will listen to their music in class, talk about what makes their music sound the way it does, and then use their music and the music of their contemporaries to discuss broader trends in art and how those reflect historical context because art is one of the best ways to view history. So somehow, despite the fact that these composers throughout history lived in radically different circumstances than we do, and they wrote such different music from each other, there's a timelessness to their music that makes it very relatable to us today. We still hear the music of Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, and Wagner, probably all familiar names, for example, in their original forms. And as we learn about their individual styles, it becomes apparent how even familiar modern music is indebted to them for their musical heritage. So my goal is that at the end of this course, you will feel more confident in expressing your views on music, whether you attend a symphony concert or a piano recital or just listening to the radio. And most of all, I hope that we will be inspired together as we listen to music together. So I'm looking forward to meeting you and discussing music with you. Thank you so much, Geraldine. I'm sorry we weren't able to see Geraldine because she is wonderful. 
I was in her class last term and it was fabulous. She is a Zoom pro, so don't take her lack of camera to mean anything, but she really can share music with us online in a fabulous way. So next, she is, uh, next we're going to hear from Bill Stoy, who will talk about rhythm ukulele, Bill. Hello. Um, yeah, my course is called Rhythm Ukulele, and in it you'll learn- Can you speak up a little bit, Bill? I can't hear you very well. Oh, okay. this any better? That's better. That's better? Okay. A little. Maybe, Maybe the volume, volume up. Didn't have any way to... Okay. Or... It's okay? All right. Well, here it is. Can you hear this thing? Is there any? Yes, we can hear it. It's very soft for some reason. I don't know. This is how I always do it, but uh, okay. <laughs> Maybe let me go into my internal if I have just a second. Let's try that. Maybe if you can just speak loudly, that would help. All right. All right, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, my course is called Rhythm Ukulele. And in it, we'll learn new and exciting techniques for strumming, picking, and plucking uh, to give songs more feeling and expression by infusing its new rhythmic styles into our playing. Um, this course is not intended for beginner level players, but if you're feeling confident at that level um, and want to further your interest and broaden your playing possibilities, I hope you'll join us. Um, here are a few samples of some of the styles we'll be playing. Take those old records off the shelf. Sit and listen to them by myself. Today's music ain't got the same soul. I like this old time of rock and roll. And a little waltz. I was dancing with my darling to the Tennessee waltz when an old friend I happened to see. And last but not least, a little positivity from a guy named Bobby McFerrin that you'll all remember. over my time, I'm sure, because of the technical difficulties. Anyway, um, I hope you could join me with in this class. It's really, really fun. We had a blast last time. Uh, if you're at a beginner level, um, I can't think of a better instructor than my good friend, Marcy Villa. She's coming up next, so thank you. Thank you, Bill, very much. And yes, let's just go from that right into Marcy, our other ukulele instructor. Marcy? You're on mute, Marcy, if you can unmute, there please. Go. There we go. 
I don't see me, but I'm guessing you can see me. There we go. There we go. Thank you. And Bill, what a great segue. We didn't even plan that, but that was perfect. Thank you. So I am Marcy Villa or Via, either way. Um, but I wanted to ask you, so what do Warren Buffett, Barack Obama, and Tiny Tim have in common? They all play the ukulele. I bet you didn't know that. Uh, but it is the greatest little instrument, especially for those of us that are over that 50 age, as a very easy instrument to learn <clears throat> and grasp. It is not, uh, it is not a difficult instrument uh, within three minutes of the first class, we will have you, or by the end of the class, we will have you playing a song. So it is that great for people of our age, even if you have no music background, if you have no music theory, you've never played another instrument, this is the instrument for you. We had a great time last, uh, I guess it's term, quarter, I'm not sure what the term is, uh, but we had a great time with 15 or more participants and I thought Zoom might be difficult, but we really had a great time um, learning the ukulele. I'm, I'm a self-taught ukulele player. I've been playing for 10 years and I think I've been teaching for Osher. I think this is my eighth year. I'd have to look back and see with under, with over 200 people uh, that we've, we've taught uh, the ukulele and are still playing today. So that tickles me how many people retain uh, the instrument playing it even after this class. So as Bill said, this is a very beginning class. We go slow and we learn um, 12 basic chords that are used most often in any youth group that you go to. If you travel the world uh, and you go to a ukulele jam someplace in Scotland, for example, these would be the chords they would be using. So this is a great start for to get going. Um, we learn strums, uh, not as difficult as what Bill teaches. We're learning just basic strumming, how to count it, how to fill it. Uh, most importantly, proper techniques, how to hold it, how to hold it proper, properly, how to hold it ergonomically so you don't have any hand pain. And, um, and then just good, some good old songs to apply uh, to the learning. So you'll walk out of there with probably a good 20 to 30 songs, good old ones, 50s, 60s, and 70s stuff, which is my favorite, but it's songs that our age group knows. Um, so the course is structured to build upon itself. So what you learned from the last week we apply to the next week and then we add something new. So it's just a continuation. So we just keep building it and building it. And like I say, we go slow. And with that, every week I send out recordings so that, that are slow so that you have something to practice with. Not only do you have the class recording to go back and listen to, but on my website, I do recordings that you can go and listen to them slowly and practice and get the music. Um, let's see, we also, uh, what I love about the ukulele is it's not just an instrument to pick up, but it's also a community, and especially here in Salt Lake City, we have a huge ukulele community, which Bill is a part of. Um, we have about 100 people that attend our jams once a month, and right now with, with, via Zoom, I think our last one was 50 people, um, but we have two youth clubs here in Salt Lake City. There's one in Ogden, there's one in Daybreak, there's one in Provo, there's one in American Fork. So no matter where you live, you can find a ukulele club that you can go and just sit and play these 12 chords that I'm going to teach you and apply the strums that I'm going to teach you. So I encourage you to take the class. Also, if you've taken the class before, I encourage you to take it again. You always learn something new the second or third time around. Um, I also bought new sound equipment, so maybe we can get some backtracks in here to uh, make it sound like more people are on the plane than just me. And uh, we'll have you strumming with three easy chords from the first class. And if that's all you learn, that's something. So I hope you'll take the class. My class is on, it starts on January the 14th, I believe at 1130 and goes for an hour and a half. And I hope to see you there and I hope to see some repeat. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. And I'm sad for another reason that we're not at Little America because our OSHA members usually play when we get together and we can hear Bill and Marcy's students show us the fruits of their labor. Thank you. Geraldine is back. Geraldine, did we get your camera on so you can at least say hi? Sounds like maybe not. 
Um, I have a comment in the Q&A from Lucy Mallon, who is a longtime ukulele student. She says, people need to know this is a marvelous introduction to the wonderful ukulele community. It's fun, it's easy, or as challenging as you want to make it, and it has changed my life for the better. That is a fabulous review. Thank you for that feedback, Lucy. And I have a question for Marcy and Bill. Um, how much would a ukulele cost if you're a complete newbie like me and wanting to get started? Um, do you want me to take that, Bill? Um, sure. Uh, anything, uh, anything from, you can start at as low as $50, which is really inexpensive and might sound a little gritty, but if that's what it takes to get you started, that's what I learned on, <clears throat> excuse me. But a really nice ukulele like this one, $100 for, this is a great ukulele that would last you for several, several years. Um, it's called a Kala, K-A-L-A, -A, good brand, good entry level uke. Um, but yeah, about $100 for a, a really nice ukulele is what I would spend. And how many do you own, Marcy? It's called you look like you have. <laughs> Ukulele acquisition syndrome is what it's called. And you, and you think, well, now I want a bigger one and now I want one with a low G string and then I want one that's a soprano and, and then I want a bass. And yes, it, it, it is kind of a, a, it becomes kind of a, you get a, quite an appetite for growing them, right, Bill? <laughs> Absolutely, I have four um, of them. Look, looks like you have some guitars as well. I have five and one for sale. <laughs> oh. Yes, I play other instruments as well. All right. Yep. Uh, I'll... Okay, well, thank you to our musicians and to Pat Lambros. We don't have any further questions, so we are going to let you all go. And thank thanks you. again for joining us. We're going to move on to our next topic, which is. Um, literature and writing. Geraldine says she's sorry her technology isn't working. We understand completely. Um, so let's move on to Bob Bader, who is starting a new class. He's a longtime OSHA member, but he is going to change into an instructor and teach us Poetry Reborn. Bob? Okay. Yeah. So, okay. This class is a journey of what poetry really is. If you like most, if you're like most students who were taught poetry in high school, you learned to hate it, where it was crammed down to your throat. You were never allowed to enjoy it for what it is, pure music. Rather, you're always looking for hidden meanings or a form. As Billy Collins says in one of his poems, my students want to chain the poem to a chair and beat a confession out of it, rather than soar with a poet and surf on his words. I believe anyone can write poetry for I've written hundreds of poems and I was not a strong scholar. I started reading and writing poetry when I first met my wife in my late twenties. It was a very tumultuous time in my life and reading and then writing poetry in response to what I read seemed to give me a way to express my emotions which I had been taught to suppress. After a while I quit writing and then picked it up again when I was in my fifties, about 20 years ago. I've been writing ever since, composing on the average 30 poems a year. I write when I'm inspired by some thought, person, or place. Words come and I write them down right away, for they go away. At the start, I know where the poem is going to go, but then the poem decides to go someplace else. I don't fight it, I just go with the flow. Within an hour, I have 80% of the poem down and spend the next month or two polishing it changing words and phrases to better express what I want to say. I love writing poetry, for it is a challenge and very creative. My writing is about putting emotion and feelings into words, and I get a thrill out of doing it. I also write to develop images to show what I see as well as what I feel. I write in free verse, which is real liberating, for you are not confined to developing a form and even rhyming. It is just free. There are millions of words and depict the ones that say what you want and express emotions that you feel or explain what you see, hear, or taste. It is very enabling and extremely satisfying. Poetry distills what you write until only the pure essence is left. Authors 
take hundreds of pages to develop stories. A poet uses only a couple and many times less than one. My emphasis on this class is going to be to encourage you to write your own poetry. But if you don't want to write, then just listen and enjoy what great poets, your fellow classmates write and what I write. I believe the best poetry you ever see is what you write yourself. It does not matter what you write, just write. The best way to learn to write is to read great poetry. So I'm going to expose you to some great poets. Poems by American poets of old like Emily Dickinson, E.E. E. Cummings, Carl Sandburg, Robert Frost, Langston Hughes, Ogden Nash, Sylvia Plath, and others. Modern poets like Billy Collins, Mary Oliver, M Maya Angelou, and others. Irish poets like William Butler Yeats, Simon Sonny, and others. Folk singers, for they are poets too. Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan, John Prine, and others. If you got any poets or poems you want to share, just email them to me and I'll put them in the class. When I first came to Salt Lake City from Grand Rapids, Michigan in 2007, I shortly thereafter joined the Utah State Poetry Society, an organization of amateur poets that is affiliated with the National Poetry Society. This gave me the opportunity to submit poems for judging and have them judged on their merits. One of the problems with writing poetry is avoiding vanity publishing, where you send in a poem and they are really only interested in what money they can collect from you. This is not the case with this society. Further, it gives me an outlet to meet other amateur poets and to attend critiquing sessions where other members sit and comments on my poems. They comment on mine and I in turn comment on theirs. You, the Utah State Poetry Society is having a poetry contest with submissions due February 1st, 2021. I am the poetry contest chair for that. Go to utsbs.org for further details. I intend for this class to be a lot of fun, to explore and enjoy poetry, not only in what it has to say, but also in how it is said. Poetry has expressed love, hatred, disappointment, disillusionment, betrayal, and all the other emotions. It has even helped start rebellions and wars. Come along and enjoy the ride. Thank you, Bob. That sounds like a fantastic new class to add to our lineup of literature and writing. Next, we have Charles Boynton, who is our Shakespeare instructor. Thank you, Bob, and welcome, Charles. Be sure to take yourself off of mute, Charles. Done. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I, I, don't see yes, my, sir. I don't see my picture, but let me uh, talk about uh, what we're going to do in our Tuesday classes on Shakespeare's tragedies. There I am, and I wanted to show you behind me are some of my friends that would be Shakespeare in his first folio and the books we'll be looking at and a little picture of Shakespeare himself. So what we're looking at, uh, we, we've got here um, a, a different uh, schedule. Uh, these are not the plays we'll be looking at. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, uh, six other plays, uh, one per week, Julius Caesar, Othello, Lear, Titus Andronicus, uh, Hamlet and Macbeth. And uh, so the first question is why Shakespeare? And of course, we all know about Shakespeare, uh, most quoted uh, writer of all time, uh, probably the uh, single most important influence in terms of development of the English language is something other than a way to talk back and forth about buying sheep or wool. Uh, Shakespeare's uh, word drive in life was to uh, show, uh, put a mirror up to nature as he put it time and again in plays and in his uh, uh, sonnets. Shakespeare uh, focused uh, history plays on uh, really from the uh, uh, Richard II up through uh, uh, Richard III. And the idea there was to explore the history. In the tragedies, Shakespeare explores the men. There still are the layer on layer of, uh, of complexity in Shakespeare's writings. And that, is, of course, is what makes Shakespeare Shakespeare. The style of our class is to uh, be participative, not lecture. 
Uh, we do readings and we have open discussions about what we've read. Uh, we also uh, talk about uh, what I call underlying material. Uh, in this case, it's going to be religion and the move from Catholicism to uh, uh, through Luther's Reformation. Those will be underlying uh, themes of these plays because it was a huge theme in Shakespeare's time. Uh, recently, we've done classes on uh, Shakespeare's jesters, uh, the women in Shakespeare, some uh, fabulous women, uh, Wars of the Roses, we just completed that uh, not long ago, and we just finished the sonnets, uh, a study of the sonnets, where we read about half of the sonnets and had a chance to talk about all of them. Uh, recently, I've, I've had the privilege of speaking uh, publicly on who was Shakespeare and on what is called the Spanish marriage, which was the development of the uh, first, fo first folio ton. The um, uh, big idea behind Shakespeare, he wrote to be heard. Uh, and the, at his time, somewhere between 5 and 10% of the population was literate. Uh, by the time Shakespeare, by the time we got 1600, maybe 15, 20%. But people got Shakespeare through going to the theater and hearing him. And so that's why we do what we do. Uh, each week I send out a little uh, cliff notes, uh, a bit about the plays. So we have a chance to uh, kind of catch up on what we've uh, forgotten about the plays. Then I also send out uh, ancillary materials about the uh, underlying themes, how the author felt, uh, how he thought and how it helped him develop his uh, complexity. Uh, that is about the story uh, of our Shakespeare tragedy um, session, which is coming up uh, this coming, uh, my goodness gracious, in the next month. So we'll see you then. One last thing, Julius Caesar, Othello, Lear, Titus Andronicus, Hamlet, and Macbeth are the tragedies we'll be looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. It's so nice to have our own resident Shakespeare expert here at Osher at the University of Utah. We appreciate you so much. And we apologize that the plays were not the correct one. So we'll fix that for next time. Next up, we have another literature instructor, Jean Fitzgerald. Jean, welcome. Hi, thank you. Uh, as you can see from uh, what's up on the screen, this course is going to concentrate on just one novel. Uh, it is Dostoevsky's last novel that was published in late 1880, and in January of 1881, he dies. So this is pretty much uh, his swan song. Uh, it's the novel that everybody has always intended to read, but never got around to it. And so it's, uh, this is your chance to do it. It is long and it is uh, daunting at some 776 pages. I'm using the Pavir and Volokhansky translation. Uh, and on Amazon, uh, the Kindle is 12 bucks and the new paperback is 15. And they say they've got 54 used copies starting at six bucks or so. It won a translation prize, but I still have problems with it. And I will describe those in class because they uh, illustrate certain central problems to the novel. Uh, so we'll start the class uh, with two nonfiction pieces, uh, one a meditation by Dostoevsky after his first wife, Masha, died, and an unfinished and unpublished article called Socialism and Christianity. And these works explore sort of Dostoevsky's ideas of the human being, the nature of the human being, and interestingly, he juxtaposes that to the nature of God slash Christ, and God slash Christ are the same as far as Dostoevsky is concerned. And he finds in that work that the nature of the human being is diametrically opposed to the nature of God Christ, a little different from uh, most theologies. So what is the novel all about? There are so many different descriptions. It is complicated, it is long, and it concerns a whole lot of things. 
a few descriptions. Uh, it's described as a murder mystery, a courtroom drama, the exploration of a neurotic rivalry. And Dostoevsky portrays, it says, the whole of Russian life, well, maybe, uh, its social and spiritual striving at a tragic turning point in Russian culture. And I have no idea what they're talking about on that one. Um, another says it focuses on the origin of evil, the nature of freedom, the craving for faith. Another just sums it up. If God does not exist, then everything is permitted. Think about that. And human beings are all guilty in everything before everyone. Think about that as well. All these things will be discussed. Uh, discussed. Um, another says the story of the three brothers uh, represents three parts of mankind, rather simplistic to my mind, which is body, mind, and spirit. Uh, another says that it's three aspects of Dostoevsky's personality. All of this could be a lot of nonsense, but it's a lot of interest as well, and we'll discuss them all. Finally, uh, we need to uh, discuss what he means by the epigraph to the novel, which is from John 12, 24. Where he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. What on earth does that mean? So I look forward to seeing you all. It's a daunting book, but a very enjoyable one. Thank you so much, Gene, for that deep dive into Dostoevsky. Next up, we have Bill Hardesty. He is going to teach us finding yourself through literature. Bill, welcome. Hey um, how do I share my screen? We need to enable that for you quickly. If you could, please. You should be good to go now. Go ahead and hit the green share screen button. Uh, I do not see a green chair, but oh, there it is. It was hiding. And then the blue share button after. There we go. Are you seeing which? Are you seeing a screen with my name on it, or are you seeing a blank screen? We've got your name on it, and cool. we've got okay. and a picture of Fozzie Bear. Because yes, sir. that's that that's my nickname for the last forty years. Um, because some people think my humor is much like um, Fozzie Bear. So keep that in mind as we take this class. But I wanted to, um, my class is about finding yourself through literature. That's, I mean, that's the title. Let me give you a little bit of background here. Oh, not going to work for me. Here we go. I have a BS in um, human development, family relations, and in a BS in sociology. I earned an MBA in, um, from Westminster College. I've spent over 30 plus years in uh, doing corporate training. And, um, and then I decided to go back to a passion I've had since I was in sixth grade, which was to be a journalist, a freelance journalist. Do you all notice that none of that has anything about literature? I am not, I love Bob's comment earlier about chaining the poem to, po to the uh, chair and beating a confession out of it. I think sometimes we do that with literature as well. That was right on, Bob. Um, so my course is a little lighter flair, I think, than maybe um, some others. I want to talk a little bit about my teaching method. My teaching method is all about questions, and that's, that's part of being a freelance journalist, right? You ask questions and people start talking and you report what they talk about. And so in my class, I don't have an agenda per se. I'm not gonna um, talk 
to you per se. I want to hear from you. I want to hear, and I just want to ask questions and see how the group comes around and 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 coalesces about certain ideas. So I ask a lot of questions. The other thing I really truly believe in is self-discovery. So as you're reading these books, and they're, they're very famous books that we're going to talk about, um, you're going to know the characters. And maybe as you become reacquainted with them, you'll have some self-discovery. And then as we meet as a group, you're going to have lot, we're going to have lots of discovery together. So from being a tree to an orchard, to use the, an analogy of whether you like it or not. Um, so these are the books that I've chosen to talk about. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird, uh, Tintin in the Tibet, which is a more of a graphic novel in today's language. Uh, the Color Purple, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, The Catcher in the Rye, and Peter Pan. Um, and you can see where I've highlighted a, maybe a topic for them. But that doesn't mean that's where we're going to go, because I think, again, it's where the group I, I want to hear your ideas. I want to hear, and, and why I say finding yourself is because I think as we read, just like in, in poetry, you find yourself, you collect, you connect with that. You say, wow, what Bob Dylan is saying is, man, I, I can relate to that. I believe as you read and particularly focus on these characters that you can say, hey, I want to be like that one. Or man, I'm glad I'm not like him or her. And so that's kind of what we're kind of talking about. So last, you know, I invite you to journey with me as, as we go along and uh, figure out what we're doing for the next six weeks. Jill. Thank you, Bill. That sounded wonderful. I love how we group our topics together this time. It's working out really nicely. Next up, we have Debbie Lehman, who Bob Bader got his idea to teach his class in Debbie Lehman's class um, a few terms ago. So Debbie, take it away. Oh, you're on mute, my dear. Is that better? There we go, we got you. Oh, great, thank you. Oh my God, I came in on the ukuleles. I want to take like every single class and uh, I don't know, everything sounds great. Um, so I am very excited to be offering this class again um, for Osher. Um, I, I love this class because I love writing personal essays. I actually think of this class as everything you've always wanted to know about writing personal essays, but were afraid to ask. Um, so the goal of the class is for everybody to have a completed essay about aging, uh, which you'll be working on throughout the course. Uh, we're going to be answering questions like, what exactly is a personal essay? Because I actually do the, get that question a lot. What's the difference between an essay and a memoir? What makes a reader want to keep reading an essay? And what makes a compelling personal essay? So I'm sure many of you have read essays that you couldn't put down. And when you're finished, you somehow had a sense of feeling connected to the writer, even their, although their story wasn't yours at all. It's like, how did they do that? Um, so we're going to talk about that. In a good personal essay, while the situations are unique to the writer, the emotions are deeply relatable. So there's something, there's a quote in the specific you reach the universal. So the more specific you, you are about your situation, the more you, universal the emotions are for everybody else. Um, so the first three weeks of the class, we're going to break down the various elements of essays, what makes them approachable and compelling. So the, for the purpose of the class, we're going to stick to the theme of aging. Um, and if you have a story to tell about aging, but you really just don't know how to get started, um, this is a great class for you. Or conversely, if you want to write, but you have no clue what to write about, don't worry. I'm going to be providing writing exercises in the first class. That's going to they're get your creative juices flowing, and it'll generate a lot of ideas for you. I mean, honestly, you can write about anything relating to aging. I just wrote an essay about letting my hair go gray during the pandemic, and I called it Pandemic Gray. I've written about my husband's retirement and how that affected 
me. Um, I've written about empty nesting and I've written about becoming a ski instructor in my late 50s. Um, so you really can, you can write about anything and we'll, we'll get into that. So my intention for the class is really to create a safe and supportive environment where we write and we just have fun together. Um, and in teaching all the classes that I've taught, um, the more I've, I've realized this, that the more we all share our stories, the more connected we feel. And we kind of realize that we're not alone on this journey. Um, and this class is a great way to do that. Um, just the breakdown of the class. Um, so the first three weeks really are gonna be devoted to what makes a compelling personal essay. Um, and then the last three weeks, we're gonna be critiquing each other's pieces. And I'll go over how to do that. Um, and every week we're gonna have writing exercises in class. At the end of the course, I'll go over um, publishing options if anybody's interested in that, and then also a way to connect with other writers. Again, this is a great, great class for anybody who wants to write. Um, if you don't consider yourself a writer, but you want to try your hand at writing a personal essay, come join us. Um, if you've taken this class before and you want to brush up on your writing skills, again, write another essay, come sign up. Um, so I'd love to have you join me. This is a two hour class and it's on Tuesdays starting January 12th from one to three. Um, and if you have any questions, just um, you can ask in the chat feature. So thanks so much and I hope to see you there. Thank you, Debbie. And yes, we apologize. The time is probably from last terms. It's definitely, um, what's Tuesdays? Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah, that's right. That was last term. So yes. it looks like we have it wrong on the website, too. So we'll get that fixed. Okay, yeah, Tuesdays 1 to 3. Okay, we'll After get that term. fixed. That's wrong on the website. All right, so we'll okay. get that you for that question, Claudia, and thank you, Debbie, for your presentation. She had me hooked at ski instructor at 50 and empty nest, and oh, I never 57. looked. 57, I became a ski instructor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, but. So if she fun. can do that, she can do anything. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah. And we have our last literature instructor. He is Robert, and Robert, I have not met you yet in person, and I'm not even going to attempt your last name. <laughs> Can you tell That's us how to say it correctly? Hi, everyone. I'm Robert Wybazal, and I'm uh, very happy to be a new OSHER instructor here in Utah. I actually am coming to you from California, and now that everything has gone on Zoom, it's opened the opportunity for me to uh, teach and share my knowledge in places other than where I live, and I'm really excited about that. Um, I am... Um, I've worked in the publishing business for about 40 years and uh, I am a writer and um, as well as a reader. And the course I'm gonna be teaching is called The Short Story and American Identity. And it's not a writing course, it's a reading course. Um, and we're going to, during the course of this class, read 18 American short stories. They're all featured in the same book. They're all featured in this book, which it's it's all on the syllabus. Um, and I am going to look at these stories, not chronologically, I should say we are going to look at these stories, not chronologically, but thematically to sort of look at uh, the way writers tell stories, why writers tell stories, and specifically in this class, what uh, how they explore different aspects of the American identity in their stories. Uh, you see on the screen, there are six categories. These are the six weeks that we'll be uh, uh, dealing with. Um, I won't read them to you because you can read them, but um, so, so, you know, some of the stories we'll be reading are very well known and others are from writers that uh, you maybe don't think of as short story writers like um, William Carlos Williams, the poet, uh, there'll be stories, well-known stories by Eudora Welty, Shirley Jackson, uh, stories by writers you may not be familiar with, like uh, Pinkney Benedict, Todd Jinn, Amy Hempel. 
Uh, and we will explore these different subjects and how the writers um, get, get to the, the core of things. I think one thing I want to say is that a lot of us stop reading short stories after we leave high school, um, maybe college. For some reason, um, everyone only reads novels. And the short story, I think, is a very viable form and a very interesting form. And I hope you'll join the class. Uh, it's a participatory class, participatory class. <laughs> um, there'll be lots of discussion. I'll, I'll provide background and we'll talk about different things. But um, so if you love to read and, and you'd love to uh, think about what stories mean, I, I hope you'll join us. And the class is going to be on Wednesday afternoons from 3.30 to 5. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much, Robert Weibazal. Did I get it Weibazal. right? Weibazal, Weibazal, like the question why. Almost. <laughs> why? Okay. Well, we know why you have us with you. We have you with us. That sounds like an excellent class. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we have time for just a couple questions from our panel. We have a question for Bill which was a lot of people have commented, Bill, about the closed captioning you had on your presentation. This is very valuable for our OSHER membership. Can you tell us how did you do that? I wish I could, um, exactly. I know that um, when I set up the uh, screen share and uh, the slideshow rather, sorry, the slideshow in PowerPoint, it gave me an option for subtitle setting and I hit it and I guess my microphone is attached to that and what a serendipitous event <laughs> occurred. You were in what program? PowerPoint? PowerPoint, yep. PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Okay, so instructors take note. You can have closed captioning within your own PowerPoint. Thank you for educating us on that very serendipitous and very valuable feature. Uh, one of our members commented that he knows someone who won't take Osher Zoom classes because he can't, they can't, this person can't read lips. So that was, that was a little gift from above. So thank you very much to Bill and thank you to all of our literature. Oh, I might have another question. Oh, I have a question for Debbie Lehman. I noticed you make a distinction between a personal essay and a memoir. Understanding that I may need a different class. However, tell me what you think. I've recently begun a two-dimensional memoir. Of course, it will get into my aging, but it also begins with birth. Some elements of your presentation could be very valuable to me. Your thoughts? Would this be appropriate for this member, Debbie? Okay, so a memoir is a lot longer than a personal essay, and a personal essay for purpose of this class, just because we have to keep it short and we have to like 1200 words, which is like four pages, four or five pages. Um, memoirs are typically longer in length. Uh, you could take a section of um, your memoir and we could we could use that for, for the class. So um, yeah, I would definitely consider that. Um, so that, that could be, uh, that would definitely be appropriate. But just keep in mind the length, just because all, every, every student has to read everybody else's pieces. So we just want to be mindful of that. So okay. I, hope that, I hope that helps. Good. That helps very much. And we want to be mindful of time as well. So we will say goodbye to our literature instructors and welcome politics and government. Thank you all. Um, Next up, we have someone very well known in Osher catalogs and Osher circles. I don't see him. Oh, here he comes. Tim Chandless will be teaching once again for us current issues in American public affairs and politics. And he's got his holiday red sweater on for us. Tim, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, Tim Chambliss, I've been teaching for Osher since January. 2007. I've just, I'm just completing my 49th time of teaching a term, uh, a class called Current Issues in American Affair, uh, Public Affairs and Politics. And the beauty of this class is that it's discussion oriented. It's very timely. Uh, it allows everybody to be brainstorming, to deal with breaking news, uh, events happening right down to when classes underway. Uh, I should say my background. I 
taught the University of Utah for decades. I had dark hair and more of it when I started uh, decades ago. And uh, I've worked for the mayor of Salt Lake City, the governor of Utah, a US senator, a congressman. Um, I have worked in over 30 campaigns and I've worked in Washington, DC. Uh, I was a national delegate uh, for uh, Joe Biden this year and I'm just uh, excited for the new administration. Uh, uh, I have close connections with the Utah State Legislature as well as Utah's congressional delegation. So, uh, so these are background elements that I can bring to our discussions. Again, the class is very discussion oriented. It's very good for lifelong learners, for people who uh, want to deal with problem solving, thinking cause and effect, what's happening, see the public uh, issues that we have and what can we do to make this society and this country better. The focus is city, county, state, federal, international, very, very wide. I, I tell my students there's no such thing as a bad answers. If you hear a bad answer from me, let's talk about it. I should say that I've taught over 30,000 students in 35 years. So I, I love teaching. I love teaching for Osher. Uh, I, uh, who would have thought this year uh, would have started off with a pandemic? with an earthquake on March 18th here in Salt Lake City, uh, with a recessionary economy, uh, uh, with an unprecedented campaign uh, year for president. And uh, the fact is, as at this very moment, arguably the campaign is still going on. Should say also my favorite uh, place in Washington DC is the US Supreme Court. I taught uh, 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 constitutional law on statewide television, Channel 9, for 15 years. I, I love constitutional law. What I try to do in being a good listener and trying to answer questions is try to bring together my sense of political history with uh, political science and a sense of government, with a knowledge of economics, with an appreciation for journalism and the media, uh, and even literature wherever I can, and try to work the problems. I provide each week uh, suggested readings and also political cartoons as talking points. So uh, this is a class that uh, I encourage everybody to be thinking, to be brainstorming, and to uh, come in with a sense of optimism. I know 2020 was a tough year. It certainly is a tough year for us right now because I've got an elderly aunt and uncle who are COVID-19 positive right now in hospice. This is a tough year, but I'm optimistic for 2021. And I invite those who are, are interested in this class to please join me on Tuesday afternoons, 1.30 to three o'clock. So it's great to see all of you and uh, hope to see you in class. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tim. Tim is just amazing. I wanna bottle your energy, Tim, so that I can have some too. Thank you. And welcome to our next instructor who is Paul Cunningham, who will be teaching us about policing in America, another very timely topic. Paul? Well, it's uh, good to be back again. Uh, this is the fourth time we've taught this class and it's evolved rapidly as the events have caught up to us in America. And so we've kind of taken a little bit of a different direction with the last class and we'll continue to do that. Uh, it's very important to understand why police reform has become such an issue in the United States. And uh, my background, uh, I spent 30 years with the Sheriff's Office here in Salt Lake County. And I was a Chief Deputy when I retired and then went to work for a city and eventually became the Assistant City Manager responsible for the Police Department and other city uh, operations. And so I think I have a unique uh, perspective on um, uh, law enforcement from the inside and then law enforcement from the outside, uh, particularly how we look at it from a management perspective. Uh, and, and some of the politics uh, that are involved in, in, in policing. One of the things we're really trying to do um, in this class is give people an opportunity to learn how to evaluate what they're seeing in the media about law enforcement actions, law enforcement reform proposals, and law enforcement activity. Um, it's never quite as straightforward as it first appears. Unfortunately, uh, many of us have a lot of bad ideas about law enforcement that have been reinforced by the novels we read, the television shows we watch, and the movies we watch, uh, which are primarily geared as entertainment and not about real life inst uh, institutions. Um, I'm the first to tell you that law enforcement has a, a long and bad history. 
um, the primary function of police in any society has to been to reinforce the status quo. And in the United States, the status quo has been racist and, uh, and unacceptable. And so I'm a police officer who knows that we uh, need to make changes and that it's time for police reform. Uh, this is not the first series of police reform activities that have ever happened in the history of the United States, nor will it be the last, but it will be interesting to watch what happens. For example, this morning or yesterday, the Minneapolis Police Department undid their earlier defunding of the police and uh, uh, did some interesting budgeting moves to explain away uh, how they have uh, not done what they said they did three months ago. Uh, and then, so we're going to take advantage of all the many events that are happening. Uh, we're going to spend 30 minutes out of every hour and a half um, on our Wednesday afternoon slot and talk about whatever we've seen in the last week and make sure we understand its perspective. Um, you know, we're going to talk about the role of police. What, what do we expect police to do? Should they be in the mental health business? Uh, is there a way to avoid that? We're going to talk about how we hire and fire and discipline police um, so that we understand that, the role of unions, uh, the issues facing police, and then we're going to spend an entire class making sure we all understand what um, police reform is all about and what the different proposals mean uh, uh, to us and, uh, as a, a community. So I encourage you to consider taking the class. I think you'll find it interesting. We have the ability to look at a lot of contemporaneous events, both video, which has become much more open and, and, and uh, uh, transparent to the community. Uh, so we will look at a lot of uh, police shootings. We will look at uh, some other police activity and uh, have a chance to evaluate them. So we're looking forward to the class. Hopefully you can join us. Thank you so much, Paul. That sounds very interesting and much needed. Next up, we have Frank Furr, also known as Fuzzy, who will teach us about American presidents and the intelligence community. Frank? Hi, Jill, and uh, thanks for putting this on. And hi, everyone, and I'm glad to have a chance to discuss my upcoming winter class. This semester, I have decided to design a class to talk about our U.S. presidents and how they work with, endure, use, tolerate, manage, uh, you name it, whatever it is, the intelligence community or the IC as we know it. We will study these relationships of the presidents with the IC. We currently uh, have some very interesting things that are going on out there with the IC staff as over the past several years now. But we also will discuss the various operations carried out by the IC at the direction of the president and as you can imagine, these operations have been highly classified as they were going on and planned and executed. But now, in a lot of cases, they have been declassified and will allow us to discuss some of them. As part of these studies, we will trace the history of our intelligence gathering capabilities and the various agencies that make up what is today's IC. While I hope to keep politics uh, out of these discussions, I know that we will never be able to, and I know we will have opinions that will differ as to just what happened, who caused it, etc. We will just keep our sanity and carry on, as the Brits would say. I come from an Air Force background where I worked in intelligence-related positions for many years. After retiring, I came to Salt Lake City and worked at L3 Communication Systems West, where I directed programs that supported intelligence gathering operations. I will bring some of my personal experiences into these discussions. I certainly look forward to this new class for me, and I hope to see you joining me for this winter semester. That uh, class will be offered on Tuesday from 9.30, 9.30 in the morning to 11 o'clock, starting on January the 12th. And thanks again for uh, the interest. Thank you so much for your class, Frank. That sounds like a very interesting one. Next up, we have Bruce Landsman, another well-known OSHA instructor. 
who is going to be teaching us this term on freedom, its scope, and limits. Bruce? Good morning. I'm, I'm Bruce Landsman. Uh, before I retired, I was an instructor, uh, I was a faculty member in the University of Utah's Department of Philosophy. And my, my main interests have been political philosophy and still are. So the course is entitled Freedom, Its Scope and Limits. In our society, we take it that people have a fundamental right to freedom or liberty. I use them interchangeably. Our basic question in this course will be what should be, what should be included in the right to liberty and what should be excluded from it? To give you an example, no one, no one has the liberty to drive a, a car unless they have learned how to drive and how to drive safely and have therefore acquired a driver's license. So everyone has the freedom to try to get a driver's license and to drive, but there are conditions on actual driving. One who drives without knowing the safe way to do so puts other people at an unacceptable risk of harm. And that's why there's no liberty to drive without a license. In contrast, to take something in the news, consider people in these days of the COVID epidemic um, who argue that being required to wear a mask violates their liberty. They say they have the right to make their own choices on matters like this. That would they say that they have the right to make their own choice. That would be a reasonable claim if wearing a mask were solely a matter of protecting oneself from harm. But of course, as you know, the main point of wearing a mask is to protect others from catching a terrible disease that you might have without knowing it. So just as just as with a driver's license, there are very good reasons for thinking that being required to wear a mask is not a violation of liberty since it protects others from the risk of harm. Now, in the case of wearing a mask, it is easy for many people, including me, to think it's reasonable to require that since wearing a mask is a trivial matter. It's not a serious restraint. And the harm it protects people from is a great one. So we have a trade-off, a minor inconvenience in order to prevent a great harm. Consider on the other hand, sorry, consider on the other hand, a case where the restraint required to prevent harm is significant. Children have a right to an education. Closing schools to prevent that harm uh, can produce um, it raises much more complicated issues. Children need an education to be successful members of society. Their parents both want them educated and further keeping them at home produces an enormous interference with their freedom to live their lives, particularly to do their jobs. So this is a much tougher case. The harm prevented by keeping children home so they don't catch uh, the, the disease um, is great, but the sacrifice required for children and their parents is also great. So many of the questions about freedom are like that, um, where we have to consider the thing and its importance um, and how it affects other people and how serious that effect is. So deciding whether there's a right to do something will have something to do with the importance of that thing for a person's life and the risk of harm the activity produces for others. And these are the sorts of questions that we will discuss. And we can't really get into discussing those questions about whether something should be part of liberty or not, unless we also have a deeper discussion of the question of, why is liberty a good thing in the first place anyway? Why is it so important that it should be considered a right? We will discuss that too. <clears throat> we will start the class with a classic text on this question. 
John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty written in 1859. It is still the best place to start this subject. It is a magnificent essay. It raises, however, more questions than it answers. <clears throat> so while it's the best place to start, it is not the best place to end. It is not the final word. And starting with Mill, then we will have plenty to consider and to discuss. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Bruce. It's wonderful to have the philosopher's perspective on this topic. We appreciate that very much. And we will now have a judge's perspective on our topic. We have a new instructor to our OSHER, Charles Shudson. Did I say that correctly, Charles? You did. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be back in Utah. This is not going to be my first opportunity to teach with you. I have uh, come to Utah many times before to teach for the U Utah judiciary and to teach at many judicial conferences at, at, Snow at the Snowbird Resort. I also, of course, grab those opportunities because I'm a hiker. I'm a search and rescue uh, volunteer. I'm a hiking guide and teacher, and I love hiking Utah. I'm just down the road from you in Sedona, so this is a particularly uh, comfortable uh, engagement for me because I'm finally within the same time zone as, um, as my host. Today, I would just like to give you some ways to consider whether you would like to join me for Independence Corrupted, How America's Judges Really Make Their Decisions. It will be two consecutive 90-minute sessions, uh, split into two weeks, two consecutive 90-minute sessions, the first of which will primarily be lecture, the second of which will be primarily Q&A. How can you evaluate whether to, to take part? Well, the syllabus is already there, and I think you'll enjoy looking at that. But how did this come about? Well, for years, I had been teaching for my local Yavapai College, Osher, and then I wrote a book. Over a period of four years, I wrote a book and it took off. And now I'm in the midst of about 40, 40 OSHER engagements coast to coast. And what happened then was word of mouth. And uh, not, not a reflection on anything that I might bring, but I think on the topic and the interest in our judiciary and the intense and growing interest in the threats to judicial independence has put me on the road and I'm now doing two or three OSHA programs each week. The interest has been intense, the discussion exciting and typical for OSHA, the quality of the participation has been outstanding. Why might you wanna take a look at this? Is this a law course? No. It's a course that is based primarily on my book, which has been termed a memoir treatise. And in four years of writing, I pulled the most exciting themes and cases from my career and added to that, hopefully, a serious level of scholarship to help us understand the history of judicial independence. Where does that concept come from? What is its shape? in the United States. But the title of the book and of this program is not independence, it's independence corrupted. What are the forms of corruption far beyond a bribe? Why were the founders so consumed by their, their really preoccupation with independence and its many corruptions? How did those influence judicial decision-making? And we learn that not just through history and theory, though that is a key part of my presentation, but we learn it through eight actual cases. Cases I judged. Four of them as a trial judge in the juvenile and criminal courts, four others as an appellate judge on the Wisconsin Court of Appeals. My background, I was a state and federal prosecutor for 10 years. I then was a trial court judge, juvenile and criminal court, for the next 10 years. I then was an appellate judge, Wisconsin Court of Appeals for 12 years. 
and I have been a law professor for about 25 years. Most recently, and perhaps most intriguingly for our purposes, I spent five years recently as a Fulbright scholar teaching at law schools abroad, Bolivia, Chile, Mexico, Iceland, Canada, Israel. I've been around helping me gain added perspective on the nature of our judiciary, looking through the lens of other judiciaries and with the fresh, vital, exciting questions from law students of our country and far beyond. You don't have to read the book in order to take the course. Indeed, I will approach all of you with the understanding that you may not have read the book. I will help us through that book even if you've not read it. However, I would be a fool not to encourage you to read it. Is this a thinly veiled effort to promote my book? No, it's not veiled at all. I want you to read it. Go to the library, check it out. Go on Amazon, read the reader reviews and, and decide for yourself whether you are sufficiently intrigued to get it. But you don't have to get it new. It's on Amazon. There are plenty of used copies. Here it is, Independence Corrupted, How America's Judges Make Their Decisions. But our seminar adds a word, Independence Corrupted, How America's Judges Really Make Their Decisions, not how they claim to make them, not how commentators and court watchers say they make them, but I will take you behind the scenes to reveal how I really made decisions involving abortion, white supremacists, multi-million dollar uh, punitive damages, and a host of other vitally important issues that affect every state in America. It's an exciting class. It is for anyone who is interested in America's judiciary, its history, its independence, its corruptions, and today's threats. And I leave you with this thought. In the history of the world, no democratic republic has survived without judicial independence. And it is not hyperbolic. It is simply historically accurate and intellectually honest to say that today, America's judicial independence is threatened like never in its history, not simply due to Donald Trump, but most particularly due to a US Supreme Court decision in 2002. We'll study that, we'll learn why, and we will understand better the nature of our judiciary and why today, this month, and in the weeks to come, everything is on the line. Without judicial independence, this country cannot survive. Join me, hopefully we'll still be alive and well a few weeks from now when we start this wonderful, I hope, Osher seminar, Independence Corrupted, How America's Judges Really Make Their Decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. It's so nice to have you join our OSHER. We're so pleased to have you and can't wait for that inside view. Thank you again. And we have come up next, Warner Wood Woodworth, who will be teaching us about how to change the world. Warner? Hi, folks. Good to see you all. Um, I'm excited about this OSHER experience. I taught a year ago, and I spend most of my life working around the globe in the third world, fighting poverty and empowering women and villagers of various countries. <clears throat> and uh, I have to confess, I've been a professor at BYU, Marriott School, 40 years. Uh, but I did go to the U for a while and have many friends. So I. I see myself as one of the heathen coming in from the south part of Salt Lake County, <clears throat> but looking forward to interacting with lots of folks. My goal with this course is to help people figure out what they can do 
to bless the lives of others with their skills, with their talents, with their brains, with their love, with their finances, perhaps, with their energy to reduce human suffering. And I think this course uh, beginning in January is going to be more relevant than ever, perhaps, because of the pandemic, as we see global recessions and suffering and struggles. Oh, thanks. You got my slide there. <laughs> and uh, and the challenges of disease, of this terrible virus of death, of devastation. What can we do to make a difference? How can we rebuild now that the vaccine is emerging as a possible uh, help for us? Uh, how can we empower others to address their problems? These are a few of the terms and countries we will spend a bit of reading and discussing and debating and sharing experiences about. Uh, I see the class is highly interactive. It will start with a definition of social entrepreneurship and what that is as opposed to business entrepreneurship. With business entrepreneurs, the goal is to build products, invent new solutions and sell them to make money. Social entrepreneurship is to look at society and see suffering, see pain, see a need and invent new strategies, nonprofits, NGOs, non-governmental organizations in various cultures. So we will look at some cases here in Utah with minorities, particularly with Latino communities and immigrants and refugees from the Middle East and then beyond that, talk about rebuilding uh, capacity in Nepal after the earthquake there, uh, how to serve lepers in India and, and, and help their children have a better society when they are shunned still today in 2020, 2021, how, how to build self-reliance in the Philippines, how to educate women especially so they have more control over their futures and uh, to share thoughts and debates and have discussions about minimizing human suffering and building a better quality of life for all. So that's the guts of this course. I look forward to it. Uh, the, the, the times I've been teaching this in Europe at uh, Cambridge University, as well as at BYU, as well as in India, as well as in uh, the University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, I found there's a huge interest and growing uh, love of making change in the world rather than us simply saying, well, this is the way it is. It's always been that way. There will be the haves and have nots. No, it's not the way it has to be. We've created the world of, of this grand divide. This course will help us figure out ways to reduce that division and build a better planet for all mankind, all womankind. So that's the plan. I think uh, the class is on, uh, was it Wednesdays, 3.30 to 5. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Warner. We look forward to changing the world with you. And we will overlook the fact that you wore your blue BYU shirt today. <laughs> I took off my faculty shirt with BYU on it. This is oh, just, thank you. Know, we appreciate that. <laughs> we appreciate that. I should have worn Welcome. red. I got you. <laughs> Welcome back to our OSHA. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. We are also delighted to have our last speaker in the politics and government section, which will be the wonderful Jane Yeager. Jane will be teaching critical junctures. Jane, take it away. Hi everyone, hi OSHA members. And I wanna say thank you to Lauren who's at home now and, and um, also all the other wonderful OSHA staff people. Jill, who, and congratulations on being interim director. She's great. She was the first one to shepherd me through Zoom um, along with Lauren and also Emily and Sheila and Ben. Also to your new instructors, just know that the OSHA staff will have your back. They're wonderful. 
and I really, really appreciate them. And also appreciate all the other instructors. I've taken some wonderful Zoom-based courses. I can't wait to see you in person. And um, the instructors are really care and they really do a great job and they really are interested in lifelong learning and welcome to the new ones. And also my fellow OSHA members, I miss you. I'm still glad we're, we're trying to connect on our lifelong journey to, to have lifelong learning. And, and, I, and I just wanna say that um, you inspire me, you give me hope. I can't wait to see you in person again. So uh, this class, Critical Junctures, the US and other democracies at the tipping point, um, this is a follow on to um, the first OSHA class I taught for the last year was um, why nations succeed or fall apart. So this class is going to build on that. And I'm gonna screen share with you. Everyone, can, can you see that? Not yet. Did you hit the blue share button? Um, there we go. OK. So oops. <laughs> wow, it's jumping all over the screen. Let's see if I can go back. OK, there you go. So we this class is called Critical Junctures. It's OSHA 326. It's going to be Wednesday, 9.30 to, to 11. Except for Inauguration Day, we're going to all go watch the inauguration uh, virtually that day. So this is, class is US and the other democracies at the tipping point. And I have to say, I, I it, it's almost like all the other um, politics and government uh, instructors it's like we all coordinated together. Those are wonderful instructors, Tim, Paul, Frank, Bruce, Charles Warner. I'm telling you, their courses fit in this framework. They, they provide insights. I've, I just can't tell you what a great uh, host of instructors we have there uh, for you to learn from. So anyway, hopefully with this, we're gonna build on the building blocks that we learned in OSHA 159, how nations succeed or uh, fall apart. And we're, we're gonna look at democracies, including the US that are kind of at a tipping point right now. Democracies, um, as uh, Charles pointed out, they're, they're just not uh, guaranteed. In fact, we, we are a fairly young country, but we are a very old democracy as far as the world goes. So we are gonna have a reading list. We're gonna build on our last reading list but I have a whole bunch of new readings for you. We're gonna use the, the concepts from before and we're gonna use our framework and we're not gonna focus on nations that are falling apart but we are gonna focus on democracies that are at critical junctures and tipping points in their history. So we will review our toolkit just briefly the concepts and the frameworks that we learned about. We're gonna talk about the chicken or the egg. Um, we are going to talk about a, a recipe for autocracy, which the US was kind of cooking up a real good one for a while and hopefully we pulled back, but it's not over yet. Uh, we're gonna talk about COVID-19 in the 2020 election. Um, we are gonna talk about the Plum Book this is the Policy and Supporting Positions book. This is the one, it's put out every four years. As you know, this is from the 2016 election. These are all the political appointee jobs, the spoils of getting elected. There's four to 7,000 of them in there. Um, the current administration still hasn't presented theirs to Congress yet, which is a little troubling. And every four years, a different, either the House publishes or the Senate publishes this book and they alternate. We are going to have a guest speaker of Lauren Yeager who um, it knows intimately the Plum Book and is gonna explain that to us. Um, and we're gonna talk about the way forward for the US. And hopefully that way forward gives us a successful nation or democracy. So that is um, that is the the course, and I welcome you to 
uh, sign up. I hope to see you in there. I hope to have a lot of discussion, especially since you know all these concepts and frameworks uh, about the book. Also, I want to let the other uh, politics and, and government uh, OSHA instructors know that the people who have taken my course before, they're going to become, uh, they're, they're going to come to your course armed and, and ready to discuss issues with you. And also, those other courses in politics and government, they're going to provide you some really incredible insights, especially if you know some of the concepts and frameworks, or you can bring those to um, into my course too. So I hope to see you all. Everyone stay safe, keep Zooming, stay connected, have a great holiday. We are going to get through this and I can't wait to see you in person again. That's it, Thank Jill. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much for your kind words about our hardworking OSHER staff. We appreciate it. And for the community piece, um, Jane likes to take classes. A lot of our OSHER instructors will take up the opportunity to take a free class during the term when they are instructing and it really does help to build our community. So thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. and welcome Harry Cachette, who is launching our next section of health. We didn't have any questions. And uh, so we're gonna launch right into our health section, starting with Harry. Harry, welcome. Hi everybody. Uh, I am very glad to be here. Um, I want to say a little bit about myself so you know who the instructor is. Uh, I am a retired clinical psychologist, and I have uh, also worked in organizations as an organizational psychologist. So all, I'm all about change, about how to understand things, how to understand yourself, and how to change. And this is such a wonderful time because we're talking about the brain, emotional style and well-being. So in the last 15 years, we've had a revolution in brain science. There is so many places all around the world studying the brain in a different way, the uses of MRIs, that allow us to really map the brain in new ways. And during one of these research studies at the University of uh, Wisconsin, one of the researchers found in looking at the neurophysiology of the brain that there are set emotions that are neurologically supported in the brain. And we didn't know about that. As a, a clinician, we have theories about the brain. We have great research from the past, but we didn't have this kind of stuff where you can see what's happening in the brain through MRIs and other things. So what we're going to do is look at how the emotional brain works. What is the emotional brain? Where is it? How does it work? And I do it with a particular orientation. One is I want to be able to give you some knowledge. And just as importantly, I want you to use that knowledge in the class, if you wish, to develop yourself. So part of this is giving knowledge. And the other part of it is encouraging you to use it to make a difference in your life. So we're gonna look at how the brain works, how it changes, what are all the new research that shows the brain works a lot differently than we thought 15 years ago. Then emotional style, how does the brain and neurological uh, uh, components determine our emotional functioning? By happenstance, the researchers found that the brain supports six different aspects of emotions. And we are neurologically programmed. How we're going to be is determined part by our neurological makeup. So there's a continuum. So one of the first things that we found 
was resiliency. People respond to difficulties and rebound from them based on an emotional style. So even though these are neurologically programmed, they're subject to change. We can change. If we are slow at resiliency, we can learn to speed it up. So even though it's neurologically and genetically supported, we can change them. And that's the goal of the class, is to let you see how you are and then see if you want to change. So another one is outlook. How do we look at the world? And how do we look at social uh, intuitive parts of the brain? Another dimension of emotional um, style is self-awareness. People differ in the degree to which they are aware of themselves. And again, that's set by neurological programming, but it can also be changed. So we can look at how to change it. People are sensitive to context. One of the understanding, uh, an understanding of post-traumatic stress disorder is that things in the environment cue our emotional response if you have post-traumatic stress. So if, you, if you're a soldier and you've been in war and you hear a car backfiring, it can trigger a whole set of psychological problems as a result of hearing that context. Again, we can change that. Um, there is a couple other parts that uh, are included in emotional style. So the other part of the course will develop some ways of looking at positive emotions. If you wanna create more compassion, you wanna create more generosity and intuitiveness to others, there's a way of doing that. And we'll look at that. And lastly, there is a new field called neurotheology understanding how the brain is affected by spiritual practices, and we'll have a little time to look at that. And so I invite you, this will be on Thursday from 1130 to 1. Uh, this is a, a very friendly environment that we try to create. People feel comfortable and safe to talk about not only the intellectual part, but also the personal part. And that's part of the style that I do. Now, the second course is called Changing the Brain for Spiritual and Personal Growth. And there is a little overlap here. Uh, I start off with what we know about the brain and how to change it. The old thinking when I was going to graduate school, when I was practicing, was that genetics, the genetic in um, hereditary that we receive sets the perimeters of the brain and it was thought it cannot change. So if you are, I uh, mean, many people will come and say to me when I was in therapy, uh, being a therapist with them, my dad is this way, I'm like my dad, I'm gonna be this way, it can't change. So one of the first questions I always ask is, well, if it can't change, why are you here? <laughs> and that begins to uh, lead to a discussion that even though they think it can change, they hope it can. And what we know about the brain now is that it can change. Genetics are triggered either triggered or inhibited by our experience. What we think is an experience. What we believe affects the brain. And then what we do every day, what do we do affects the brain. So we can change what happens. We're not in this terrible bind of thinking just because we inherited something, it can never change. It's not true, it can. There is a term that we will look into called neuroplasticity, 
that is the built in our own brain is the capacity to change. So part of this course is having people think about as we're now in our older years, how do we want to spend our other older years? What capacities do we want to develop? Being older does not mean you can't live a creative, a successful, a fulfilling life, even though there are going to be challenges with our body, we can also learn to go beyond that. So there is another area called what is religion and brain science? There's that whole new area called neurotheology in which they study the effects of prayer on the brain, the effects of meditation. And then we know how the brain supports spiritual practice and that the difference between the brain and the mind will look at that. Um, I'm going to go down the rest of this a little bit. Uh, I'm trying to remove some things that are showing up on my screen. Um, how the brain creates our lives. Everything we do Everything we think, everything we feel is accompanied by a neurological component in the brain. There is nothing that we do without having neurology of the brain involved. Once we understand that, we can also learn to change it. What does God do to your brain? That comes out of the, uh, the book on um, neuro theology, and it really looks at some of the practices and its effect on the brain. So there are spiritual and personal changes that we're going to discuss that you can choose to decide how you want to be. It is really possible to create the rest of your life in a good way. And we'll look into that. And lastly, we will look at some of the scientific and the yogic philosophy of spirituality and brain science. Ancient uh, or uh, yogic philosophy really does look at brain change. And so we'll discuss that. So I invite you to come to either class or both classes. This one's on Tuesday from 11.30 to 1. It's a participatory class. We respect people, but those who want to engage, you'll find this class very engaging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. That sounds marvelous. We appreciate it, and we are glad to have you back teaching for OSHER. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Carol Lessinger, who will be teaching your life is only as comfortable as your movement. And Carol, be sure to take yourself off mute. Thank you for that reminder, Jill. You're welcome. And hello, everybody, and welcome. It's um, an honor to be here and really good to follow up on Harry's presentation. Uh, because my course is also about brain plasticity. And it's based on the Feldenkrais method. Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais was a physicist. And in the 1930s, before brain, brain plasticity was even thought about, he was talking about the possibility to change our wiring. And since we are always doing four things simultaneously. We are thinking, we are moving, we are sensing our movement, and we have an emotional status that's going on. So every moment of our lives, those four things are happening. And what Dr. Feldenkrais decided to do was say, well, let's enter the system through not just movement, but through our perception of our movement, that is awareness through movement. And 
That is the way that the brain changes by perceiving what's going on at a more and more elegant level. And then you can shift the way you move. So the way we move through life and the way we move in our body has something to do with each other. Now, whether or not you've got challenges, maybe a past uh, injury or a present one, this is not like yoga. It's not like exercise. And so for that reason, it's kind of hard to explain because people want a, a point of reference. What it is, is very gentle movement that's safe for everybody. And what you're doing in the movement is perceiving the sensations as they move through your body and how everything is connected to everything else. And so I'm looking at the um, syllabus here and it mentions the different parts of the body that will be a focus. But quite honestly, depending on who takes the class, I will design the class for the people who are in it. I've been teaching for over 40 years I taught through the Division of Continuing Education before OSHA was uh, on the books. And I was there from 1981 to 98, very joyfully teaching at the university. So uh, we'll be happy to entertain questions. You're welcome to be in this class at whatever level of movement you have, uh, you can, you can participate and I look forward to seeing you. So take care, thank you. Thank you, Carol. That was nice how your class dovetailed with Harry's and talking about the brain. That makes me think we need to keep doing this grouping by topic. That's wonderful. And we look forward to having you back next term. Thanks, Carol. And next we have Stephen Urquhart. Did I say that correctly, Steve? You did. You did. Welcome. Steve's going to be teaching psychedelics and healing. So tell us all about that. Perfect. Um, thank you. Good to be with you. I'm excited about this. First, I'll tell you about me. I'm a lawyer. Um, I was in the Utah legislature for 16 years, eight years in the House, eight in the Senate. I teach at the University of Utah Medical School uh, in the Division of Public Health. I teach health policy and leadership and another course called Health Systems and Services. For this class, um, you don't have to read them. Um, you'll be able to keep up without reading them, but they're just great books. Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind and Brian Murder Rescues, um, The Immortality Key, The Secret History of the Religion with No Name. We're going to talk about what I think is the most excited, exciting and rapidly moving development in mental health going on right now. And that is the use of psychedelics. Um, first, let me start with the medicalization. Um, lest anyone thinks this is just crazy uh, disjointed hippie talk. Um, psychedelics are being used by John Hopkins University. They're in FDA uh, fast track phase two studies to treat um, resistant therapy, sorry, treatment resistant depression, having tremendous success with that. Um, also MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies um, is in phase three FDA studies using MDMA, which was a common club drug called Molly to treat PTSD, tremendous success with that. Um, and then also many doctors in Utah and around the world are now using ketamine to treat depression. So we'll first talk about the medicalization. And uh, if people in white coats say that it's okay, then sometimes we have more confidence with that. Then we'll move on to talk about legalization. Um, we have some exciting developments going on. Uh, just last month, Oregon passed two measures Measure 109, which uh, that allowed for psilocybin, and that's magic mushrooms, psilocybin assisted uh, therapy. And it also decriminalized uh, all scheduled drugs, moving away from a criminal model to a public health model, like Portugal and other countries have done with great success. Uh, Washington, D.C. did the same thing. So rapidly, uh, 
changing front legally also. We'll talk about why these substances work. Um, so Harry talked about neuroplasticity, and that's the key to this. And then we'll take that from the medicalization into new frontiers, which are actually old traditions. The history of psychedelics is actually the history of humans. Um, these things have been used for millennia. That's what the immortality key goes into. Psilocybin has been used all around the world. Um, ayahuasca comes out of South America and then indigenous cultures have used that for millennia. Ibogaine uh, similarly has been used in Africa. Ibogaine, for example, we're now using that uh, very, very effectively to treat alcoholism um, just with tremendous results. And then we will talk about use of psychedelics in Salt Lake City in Utah. We'll talk about um, what's going on around the world uh, legally, what's going on in basements, what's going on in religion, and how psychedelics really are changing the world around us. We'll talk about the leaders in industry and art who use psychedelics uh, to tap into their subconscious and to tap into tremendous creativity. Um, this is a very, very exciting um, issue that really is coming on in force, and I look forward to talking with you about that. Thank you so much, Steve. We look forward to learning about that and we welcome you to Osher. Thank you, good to be here. Great to have you. Okay, we have up next and almost last in our health section, Dr. Dave. Dave, your last name is Zero. I can't say it. Please tell us how to say it. Hi, Jill, I can't see myself. Is, is that good? Oh, there I am. We can see you. Tell us how you say your last name because I was afraid. I'm, I'm, people call me Dr. Dave at the U and my last name is Derizotis. And uh, thanks for the intro. And I've been listening to an hour of presentations and they all sound like fun, especially the last one. Um, this program that I'm talking about that some of you may be interested in is uh, about us us older people. And um, I've been a therapist for 40 years and teach mental health at the College of Social Work to future therapists and, and uh, have taught a class on mental health of adults and aging for years. So this is an area of interest uh, to me. And so um, if you are brave enough to choose this class, uh, what we'll all do is uh, first explore what ageism is, um, which is not just in the US, not just in Utah, but in some ways all over the world, and, and, and study how much each of us may have internalized it. All that means is that I, um, if I grow up in an ageist society that views older people from a certain kind of bias, uh, then I might take that in unconsciously and feel the way that uh, many people feel towards older people. Um, most of you know what I'm talking about when I talk about ageism, but it basically refers to all the biases. Many of them are hidden and not conscious that uh, folks have about uh, people over 50 or 60 that you know we're, we've lost intelligence, that we don't have as much usefulness, um, that, uh, that, in fact, it's the opposite of what many of the world's wisdom traditions um, felt uh, and, and taught about older people. So after we study a little bit about what ageism is and its effect on us, uh, then we'll look at, um, each of us will do a project basically that we'll present in the last class where we think about how we would like to see you know, the, this last part of our lives go. And what's my current relationship with my life and with my death? And what's important for me to um, be or do uh, in these last years? How can I um, live consciously, in other words, in, in a culture that's ageist? So there's some reading materials and I won't assign them, but I'll make them available to people. We might choose to watch some films that I've used in my classes that I really like, including um, some about uh, what it's like to be in a relationship, a romantic relationship when I'm over 50 or 60, and what are some of the common 
issues that we have with the people we love romantically, as well as uh, what are some of the conflicts we have in our family with our usually adult children that um, are related to ageism. Uh, so if you're interested in self-reflection and sharing with other people and listening to other folks and kind of co-creating a community where we hang out together and um, talk about these kinds of issues and then have an opportunity to choreograph the rest of your life, consider taking this class. Um, be glad to talk to any of you if you have any questions or concerns. Thanks, Jill. Thank you so much, Dr. Dave. That sounds so interesting and appropriate for our group. Um, we appreciate you joining us. I think we have one more slide to show for one more class. I'll just mention it even if we don't have the slide. One of our instructors couldn't make it today. Um, many of you know him, David Keyes. He is going to teach another very good class for our age group. Um, it's going to be fall prevention and balance improvement. So David Keyes also teaches Tai Chi. Um, he's taught for us for years and he's going to teach on Zoom. There'll be mini lessons, warm ups, balance exercises, and I don't even know what Shibashi moves are, but I do know what gentle Tai Chi is and it's wonderful to get your joints moving and limbered up and very low impact. And so if you are interested in that kind of exercise, you have two options, one for Carol and one for Dave's class. And then we do have a question in the chat for Carol, if we can bring our panel back just briefly and keep you a minute or two over time. Carol, we had a question from Denise. She wants to know she has an acute hip issue and is waiting for the pandemic to subside in order to have surgery. Is your class appropriate for helping her feel more comfortable waiting? Yes, it is. And a brief answer to that in that um, since all of the lessons are pretty systemic and what they do is organize the body to be more efficient and functional throughout the body. So whatever, uh, I'm losing a word here, uh, whatever deviations from a normal movement has occurred because of the pain from the hip, uh, she can, um, what was the name of the questioner again? I want to talk directly to her. Denise. 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 Uh, Denise, you can opt into doing movements that uh, will reflect a whole body organization that will help your hip. If there's anything in the sequences that is painful, you simply do those in your imagination only because what you pretend to do with consciousness the brain will fire all of those neurotransmitters for that movement without you uh, putting any stress or injury into your hip. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that specific answer to help out Denise, we appreciate it. And then uh, one last question for Harry Cachette. How do these classes differ or duplicate other or similar classes you have taught in the past? And Harry, you're on mute still, so if you can unmute, please. If you take the same class that you took before, the material is somewhat different, but there's a lot of repetition. Uh, so it's better to take a class that you hadn't taken before. In the, uh, in the spring, I will be teaching a completely different class which anybody who took a class from me before can take and would be different. But uh, I think you have to just decide if you had something and you want to review it, fine. There's a little differences, but otherwise choose a class that you hadn't done before. Hope that answers your question. That helps, yes. Thank you, Harry. And thank you to all of our health panelists. We had one last question in the chat, which was about Dr. Dave's class. 
living consciously in an ageist culture. I think the slide may have had the wrong time. The correct time is Wednesdays, 1.30 to 3 o'clock p.m. So if you can join us then for that class, we'd love to have you. And thank you all so much. Bye now. Thanks for joining instructors. Goodbye to everyone. And registration again will open tomorrow, Friday at 9 o'clock a.m. on our website. If you have troubles, feel free to email us. We will not be in the office. We're not allowed to be in the office. It's not safe to be in the office. So don't leave us a voicemail. We won't get it. But if you email us, we will get it. And we will get back to you if you need help. So thank you again for joining us and we'll let you go and we look forward to seeing you in January. Bye-bye everybody. Bye everybody. Thanks Harry.